everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode of Beginner Breakdown. My name, as always, is Alex Mollering, and tonight I am revisiting a topic. So I don't know exactly how long ago, but a little while, a few months uh, maybe ago, uh, we did a video on this channel uh, I did on forcing moves. I believe it's called Forcing Their Hand. Feel free to look it up. It is not required viewing before you see this one. Um, but I'm actually revisiting the topic for three reasons. First one, it's just that important a topic. Forcing moves, I think, is one of the most critical things you can learn that will bring your game from a beginner level into a more intermediate stage. Uh, second reason is in the last lecture, um, I gave kind of a basic definition of forcing moves that lacks some nuance, and I'm afraid it might mislead people. Uh, kind of the third reason ties into that is I didn't really articulate my process for how to apply forcing moves in your games. I just kind of showed some examples and I think they were good examples. They're still relevant, but I want to work more on how to apply forcing moves and really understanding it in depth. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into it. Uh, to kind of help us redefine and just restate what's going on here, I want to start with uh, looking at Morphe's Opera House game. We're not going to go all the way through it, but it's a really famous game and it's really helpful for a lot of different reasons. Um, but let's just take a quick look at what happens. So. Uh, Morphe begins with e4, his opponents play e5, we have knight to f3 attacking the pawn on e4, d6 defending, this is the Philidor defense, that's not very relevant for this video, but it's what that move is called, defending the pawn on e5, d4 attacking the pawn, and uh, already there's sort of a forcing move going on, um, this is kind of a, a threat, right, and this will make more sense when we understand our definition of a forcing move. A forcing move, the way I would like to redefine it, is a move that forces the other player to immediately respond or suffer a serious disadvantage. So it's again, it's a move that forces the opponent to respond or suffer a disadvantage. Um, the other kind of piece of forcing moves is they really limit the amount of moves an opponent can play in response. So let's consider what's going on here. With the move d4, Morphe is attacking the center but he's also very simply making an attack on this pawn. Um, in the same way that knight to f3 attacks the pawn on e5, this is a forcing move, black has to do something, but it's not, the reason I wouldn't think of it as much of a forcing move is because black has so many ways to respond. Um, you can respond by defending the pawn with this pawn, as happened in the game, or with this knight. You could play some maybe dubious moves, like defending it with the bishop or the queen. You could not defend it at all and counterattack our pawn. There's just a lot of options. So I don't think it's as useful in when thinking about forcing moves if there's just a ton of options. You really want your opponent to be limited in how they can respond. So let's continue. D4, the threat is we're gonna take this pawn on E5 and we're gonna take twice. We have two attackers, black only has one defender, so they need to do something. And in the game, bishop to G4 was chosen. Again, maybe not the most critical example of forcing move because there are a lot of options, right? You can add more defenders to this pawn. Even if it's not a good move, you can do it. You can still counterattack this weak e4 pawn with something like knight f6. There's just a lot of potential options here. You could play knight c6. So bishop g4 was the option actually chosen in the game, which is removing this as an attacker of the pawn because now the knight is pinned. If the knight moves, then the queen will be taken. So you don't want to do that. Uh, in the game, Morphe plays D takes E5, taking the pawn, and we reach kind of a critical moment. If you haven't analyzed this game, um, there's some other videos, there's a lot of videos on the Opera House game. It's one of the most famous ones in chess history. Um, but the idea here is actually a little more complicated. Black would like to just retake the pawn, but the problem is if they retake, then we can force a trade of queens and then notice how our queen is no longer on d1, meaning this knight is not pinned and we could eat this extra pawn. So in the game, that's not what happened. Um, we've played a forcing move, right? We captured a piece. If black doesn't do something about that, then we're just gonna be up a pawn. Uh, and that would already be a significant disadvantage. Just being down even a pawn can mean a lot uh, if you're gonna give it away for free. So black has to do something to try and maintain the material or gain some positional edge that compensates. And in this case, they play the right move because taking here is not so good. They play bishop takes f3. And now we're gonna start to see another level here, right? So a capture is a forcing move 
This is maybe a higher order forcing mover, a higher tier than the previous one. This takes a pawn, this takes a knight, so already the piece is higher value, and it also attacks the queen. So um, you wanna be careful with your forcing moves. We'll talk about this more later on in the lecture, but you wanna make sure it's actually really forcing your opponent into doing something that's beneficial. Okay, uh, for our purposes here, white plays queen takes f3, black retakes the pawn, and the material has equalized, but white's gonna go on to play a few more moves um, white plays another very forcing move here, bishop to c4. Developing a piece and opening up space to castle, yes. Uh, so following good opening principles, but also uh, making a threat against this really vulnerable f7 pawn. It's only defended by the king. And so now if black doesn't do something about this threat, we are going to, on our next move, play queen takes f7 and call checkmate. So black really needs to do something here. Um, what they do in the game is knight to f6, which is okay, but Morphe still has a really nice response. Queen to b3, lining up the queen and bishop again. So renewing the threat. Again, our threat is not checkmate this time, but it is to take this pawn, force the king to move, not be able to castle. But also, we're threatening on b7 here, so this is a fork. Morphe is a master of efficiency. Um, he's doing a lot, making moves that have multiple purposes. Um, but what I want you to focus on here is just um, the forcing nature, right? Black needs to do something. In this case, they evaluate that the threat to this pawn is not as serious as the one here because this pawn accesses the rook, but this one accesses the king, and the king is the most important piece. So black plays queen to e7, and we're just going to look at like two more moves. This actually lays a bit of a trap, and we can see it if, again, we think about forcing moves. The move Morphe plays in the game is very good. He plays knight c3, just being very solid and safe, developing a piece and preparing to continue his attack in the center. Had he been a little more greedy and played queen takes pawn on b7, then even though he's going to win this pawn, black now can use forcing moves to try and uh, make it as close as possible. They have to do something about this rook. They don't want to just give it up. But this move queen e7 actually lays a little bit of a trap because now after queen to b4 check, uh, we have a very common example of a forcing move, right? Check is probably the, the, the poster child for forcing moves because you have to, by the rules of the game, keep your king safe. Um, in this case, it forces a queen trade, which makes the queen not able to attack this rook. And bishop takes, and black is down a pawn, but doing okay with their pieces being active. They have a little bit of initiative. We're not here to analyze this game in really deep detail, but it, I do think it illustrates kind of our forcing moves. So again, to repeat the definition that I'm using for a forcing move here. A forcing move is a move that forces your opponent, or if your opponent's doing it to you, it forces you, but it forces the other player to immediately respond to that move directly or suffer some serious disadvantage. Forcing moves also tend to limit the number of possible responses. Okay, so now I want to kind of contrast this with a very common definition and one that I sort of used in the last video on forcing moves that we did on this channel. The kind of common definition of a forcing move that many people just default to is that forcing moves are checks, captures, and threats. And while this is a true definition, I do think it can be a little misleading, so I want to explain. Um, Think about the relationship between rectangles and squares. In this case, you can see I've kind of made this, this is the box for those who are familiar with kind of pawn promotion and how to catch a pawn, but that's beyond the topic. But uh, the box here, we have a square, right? Um, it's the same amount of, I guess, square of squares, in this case of units, uh, long as it is tall. A rectangle could be a little farther, it could be a little shorter. But the difference between these two is that um, even though both are four-sided four -sided shapes with four right angles, um, each side of a square has to be the same length, while rectangles can have uneven lengths. Um, what this means is that all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Okay, this is not a math lesson, this is a chess lesson, so how is this relevant? Well, I think the common definition of forcing moves operates in a very similar way. All checks, captures, and threats are forcing moves, yes. But 
not all forcing moves must be checks, captures, and threats, at least obvious ones. And let's consider a few examples to kind of illustrate this point. This is a very unusual endgame. We have dead even material. I guess it's a bishop pair versus a knight and a bishop, so slight imbalance. But basically material is totally equal. It's just one side has a bishop for a knight. However, black's pieces are very poorly placed here. Um, this bishop is on the back rank defending the knight. The king is kind of trapped on the edge of the board by our king. And this knight is pinned to the king. In almost any other circumstance, this endgame would be a draw, but because black's pieces are so cramped, white actually has a way to win. And so I want to kind of walk through this by looking at forcing moves. Most people would say, okay, what's kind of the obvious forcing move here? It would be a capture and a check bishop takes on c7. But there's a problem with this move. Bishop takes c7 just invites black to recapture. Bishop takes, I mean, if they move to the corner, it's checkmate. So they don't want to do that. But bishop takes kind of the obvious move. And now we can't recapture. Their bishop is defended by their king. We have to move our king. And we have opposite colored bishops. There's nothing else on the board. This is a very, very easy draw. There's actually, even if one side blunders one of their bishops, there's still no way to force a win with just a king and a bishop against a king. So this would be a draw. So our most forcing move uh, is not really effective here. But if we expand our definition to what we said before, we want to play a move that forces our opponent to respond in a very specific way or suffer consequences. Um, and we want to really limit the moves our opponent can play. We actually have some options here. And someone in the chat, uh, Subash Chandra Bose, I believe, uh, says we need to play a waiting move with our bishop. So we just need to delay. And there's actually a very important reason for this. So let's just pick uh, an idea here. Let's play bishop to d6 and just say, we're just going to wait. We're going to do the same thing as before. This doesn't really seem like a forcing move, but I actually want you to think about this particular position. Black cannot move their knight. They have no moves with it. Um, if they move their bishop anywhere, right, it has to be on one of these squares. I mean, if they move it here, I guess we can just take it. Um, but to, if they move it to any of these spaces, then they're not defending their knight anymore. Any move the bishop takes, and it moves, I'm sorry, we take the knight, and it's not defended anymore. The king has one legal move, and checkmate. So two of black's pieces can't move, and black actually only has one move. They can only move their king to a8 if they don't want to do one of these two pieces. So we have completely limited what they can do. From here, we can kind of reconsider our forcing moves. And kind of the nice obvious idea would be to call check, bishop to f3. Um, if the king goes back, this is a little more high level than this class might be uh, ready for, so that's okay. We're actually gonna invoke a concept called zugzwang and force our opponent to have to play a move they don't wanna play. In this case, the move is bishop to b7, because now, this king can't move to either of these squares. We've taken control from both of them away. The knight still can't move because it's pinned, which means everything we said before about this bishop moving now has to happen. It has to move somewhere, and wherever it moves, we take the knight and it's checkmate. There is a slight problem with this, though. After bishop f3, black does not have to play king back. They can actually play the really smart move, knight to d5, check double check. We can't take the knight because then our king gets taken by the bishop. So we have to move our king out of the way. And really wherever we move it, um, black will have just enough time to survive. It's actually not easy to do, but if they play something like bishop c7 and force a trade of one of one set of these pieces, um, then they will be okay. Even again, even if we win one of these two, it's not going to be enough to force a win of the whole game. But we can learn from this and say, okay, we need to do this idea, but our waiting move can't allow this knight to eventually come to d5. So we want to play a bishop move that doesn't let this get blockaded. And the actual solution here is to play bishop to d7. It's, again, a weird way to think about forcing moves, but we are significantly limiting how our opponent can respond. If they move the bishop anywhere, we take the knight and win. 
So they have to move their king, and we can repeat what we saw before. Check. This time they can't block with the knight. They only can go here. And we repeat what just happened before. The bishop will have to move, and we get a checkmate. This is a complex example. I would not expect you, if you're coming to this beginner breakdown class, to maybe find this in your game. But uh, I do think it's helpful to think, to broaden our understanding of forcing moves beyond just simple checks and captures, right? It can mean more than that. Um, and here, let's give a little more example and illustration to help uh, show what I mean farther. Another reason I like the definition of forcing move I'm presenting here more than the just kind of common checks, captures, threats, um, is because sometimes checks, captures, and threats aren't that forcing, and sometimes they just aren't even good moves. Um, so here's an example. Uh, in this game, let's just play some very simple moves. e4, e6, d4, d5. We have a French defense. Knight to d2, defending our pawn. Let's say black takes and we take back. And in this position, black has an option. They can play the forcing move, bishop to b4. Uh, but let me ask the kind of audience here, do we think bishop to b4 check would be a good move? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. No, because there are just like too many ways to block and all of them block the check and do one or two things. A, even though one is a straight out move, the knight back to b2 is a way for the move. Mm -hmm. And it's straight out useless. Bigger to d2 is not the most forcing move, but a forcing move because you are attacking the bishop and you are developing a piece. Yeah, so we could play bishop d2 and develop. I think that would be good. I think probably even better. We Like you said, we have a lot of options. We can block with a knight. We could even block with a knight on c3 if we really wanted. Um, I think the best move here is just pawn to c3. Just seems like a way. Yeah, we're gonna sol we're gonna solidify our center. We're attacking the bishop, which means they have to spend an extra move just moving away. Yeah. Um, so they're wasting time moving this bishop a lot, while they're just helping us do what we want. We want to solidify the center. The only reason we might not want to play c3 is because it's a good square for the knight, but our knight's already in the middle, so that doesn't really matter anymore. Um, so yeah, this is not a great check. Let me show you a worse one. Let's look at this game, d4, knight f6, f3. I know unusual, generally I wouldn't recommend playing this move at the beginner level, but there's some ideas to it. e6, e4, b6, a bit of unusual pawn play from both sides, e5. In this case, bishop to b4, the same idea is actually way worse because now when we play c3, we could also block with other pieces, but c3 is the best move because we've created two threats. Right? So just because you can play a check or a capture and force something to happen does not necessarily mean that is going to be in your favor. In this case, black solved the problem of their knight being attacked by attacking our king, but then we solved that problem by attacking their bishop and they can't save both pieces. So those are some cases where checks, even though they're forcing, aren't super useful. Here's a case where a capture isn't that useful. So take a look, and I want to ask you, in this position, it's black's turn to move, and let's say you're considering the move knight takes e4, just trading the knights. What might lead you towards or away from that decision? Uh, say more. Oh, you said say more? Yeah, yeah, so oh, say more about that. Yeah, so it's defended. It would just be a trade. Yeah. But there's a more concrete reason why this is a problem. Because sometimes you're okay with trades. In this case, there's a lot of material in the center. Maybe we would want to spend some time and just get rid of some of it. Um, so there could be arguments for it, but there's actually a very specific reason we don't want to do that in this example. There's a big problem with knight takes e4.
Yeah. Yeah. Is vector C4 after C6 equal? Mm -hmm. I believe it's you have to you allow white to gain a tensile because your bishop is hit. So it's you're you're right. It's actually worse than that. If knight takes c4, and a lot of people in the chat have found the right answer and suggested, thank you for commenting. Um, the problem is very simple. If we take on e4, we are significantly improving white's pieces because not bishop takes. Bishop takes is kind of equal. If queen takes, we now have two threats. White is threatening to take our bishop. White is also batteried up with their bishop, threatening checkmate. We cannot stop both. We are either losing our king or our bishop, and so you have to do something about the threat. White wins a piece. So here's a, a, a kind of a classic example of where a capture is not, even though it's a forcing move, it's not good. Now, does that mean forcing moves are not useful or not valuable? Quite contrary, um, but we'll get to that in a second. The basic idea is even though this is not a good move, we can still use the idea of forcing moves to quickly rule it out. We can say, okay, we're going to capture. White's limited in their responses. They either have to take back with one of these pieces. It's the only way they can try and stay in the game. Um, and we can quickly see, okay, wait a minute. If they take with the, uh, if they take here with the queen, then we are in serious trouble. Um, probably, so some people are suggesting better moves in the position here. Um, probably knight takes d5 is very good. Bishop to f5 might be okay, but again, you want to look out for forcing moves. So want to be a little nervous of this discovered check. Knight takes f6, and then maybe they take our bishop. It's a little complicated, but maybe there's some ideas to it. Okay, but let's move right along to our next idea here. So, okay. So why do we emphasize forcing moves? Especially me, like I, I'm telling you these are really important, but I've given you so many reasons why you shouldn't trust them. Let's actually explore. Why are these so important and how can they elevate your chess game? I've got three reasons. There's probably more, but I've boiled it down to three. First one, the main reason, they maximize efficiency in our calculations. Second reason, they induce creativity and help us um, look beyond the natural intuitive moves. And three, they can actually reveal things about the position to us that we wouldn't have seen if we didn't look at them. We're gonna break those down one at a time. So we have efficiency, creativity, and kind of revealing truths about the position. Let's look at that first idea. The main reason forcing moves are useful is because of efficiency. We, especially if you're playing in tournaments or online, um, and you're not playing like a correspondence game, a big part of chess is dealing with the clock. You only have so much time to make your moves. So it's important not only to find the best moves when you can, but also to be efficient with how you spend your time looking for moves. I could look at this position and try and look at it for, you know, five hours, and I could look at every possible move. I could look at pushing these pawns. I could look at moving this knight, moving this rook. You know, you could look at every move and say, okay, what if I do this? What could they do? You just don't have time. There's not enough time in the day or in the year, let alone, um, and it's not gonna get you very far in your chess. So forcing moves are incredibly efficient. Um, in this case, so yeah, do you have an idea? So I noticed that the rook and the queen are garaging E2, I believe. Mm -hmm. The only defender of it is the knight. If, we, if the knight wasn't there, we could capture the pawn on E2. Yes. And it is made so we could do a removal de defender, take away, uh, and eliminate the knight so mm -hmm. that we can, so that we can checkmate. A hundred percent. You are totally correct. Um, so let's look at this a little more kind of uh, one step at a time because you're totally right. Um, but if you didn't see all that right away, the way you could solve this position would be to say, okay, wait, I see that, like you said, the rook and the queen are lined up against e2. And you can imagine you're forcing moves. Maybe queen takes e2 or rook takes. Well, let's say you start with rook takes and you're like, oh, well, if I then take with the queen, it's more powerful. But you realize the problem, as you said, this knight on g3 is defending. So now we can look at forcing moves again. Our next step is our captures and checks. Um, we have this nice capture, bishop takes g3, removing the defender. And this forces our opponent to respond, not just because we're taking the knight, but because we're calling check. 
So they have to do something. If they take back, if they recapture, then the knight's gone and this will be our checkmate. So they can't recapture, which means they have to move. The good news here is you know at, le at the very least you're winning a piece um, because they can't take this back, but probably there is better. So uh, bishop takes g3. Now we wanna look at the next ideas. If they're not gonna take back, they have to move the king um, because they have to get out of this check and they can't block on this square, there's nothing to put. So where can they move their king after we play bishop takes g3? Yes, they got three moves. Um, I don't want to go too much into my process yet. We'll spend some time on that later. But the basic recommendation I'm going to give is to say, which one of these three moves do you think is the easiest for us to refute? Essentially, we either want to say this, this move is going to be the easiest for us to beat or the easiest one to beat us. Yeah, what do you think? Okay. Well, you're close, but then the king will go back to c1. And then, wait, I believe, yeah, I believe that the king will go back to c1. And then, wait, I believe, I know there is a mate somewhere. There is a mate somewhere. Um, but I would actually say starting with f1 is going to be easier. So let's imagine takes king to f1. I think this is going to be easier to beat. Because I'm going to do the same thing as before. I'm going to take on e2. Um, in this case, you only have one move. You have to go back to g1. And can you find checkmate from that position? I believe yeah, actually the bishop also works, either one. So if this is what happens, check, then either bishop or queen to f2 is checkmate. We win the game. So we have proven that that doesn't work. Uh, you can't go here. So we, we can eliminate that in our calculations. Now we want to look at these two. Um, for this example, I'll, I'll put these moves on the board to make it a little easier to see. But the good news is actually, regardless, if we play queen takes e2 next, another forcing move, because our opponent only has one option, whether they go to d2 or to d1, they will then have to go to c1, which means those two lines are going to transpose and we don't actually have to think of them as separate lines anymore. For example, here, this is the exact same position as if they had played right here. There's actually no difference in the positions, it's just the move order. So we get to this position, and again, it's very forcing. Uh, the answer here as uh, Moroccan Nakamura, that's a really great name in the chat, has pointed out. Um, yeah, the next forcing move we have to look at is just bringing the bishop back to f4. A really nice check, and white is very limited in their options. They can block with the queen, but that should be a very easy win for us. Um, or they can block with the knight. And if they do this, can anyone find the kind of forcing move to get a checkmate? Not in one move, but in two. Mm-hmm. Yes, queen to e1 check. Sacrificing the queen normally wouldn't be a good idea, but because it's forcing, we can very quickly eliminate this idea and say, okay, if they take, well, now we notice this back rank pattern. The king is totally stuck behind all of these pieces and we have won. Um, okay, so hopefully that is a little bit valuable in thinking about efficiency, right? We don't have to waste our time on every move calculating what if I played pawn to c5 or what if they play bishop to a3. You can really cut down both on your own moves and your opponents by looking at what are the most forcing options. In this case, we found ones that worked and forced our opponent to get checkmated. But even if you don't, you can still sometimes win material or just quickly go through the whole line and say, okay, none of these forcing moves do any good for me, so now I can start to look at non-forcing moves. Okay, so that was the first reason forcing moves are super useful is because they are uh, very good at helping us be efficient in how we calculate positions. The second way that I think they're very helpful is in inducing creativity, helping us to be more creative in how we play chess. 
So for this, I actually want to show a very common uh, position. Not the most common, but it happens a lot, and it's a very useful pattern if you haven't seen it before. So we have e4, e5, knight to f3, d6. Again, the Philidor defense. Bishop to c4, bishop to g4, knight to c3, knight to c6, pawn to h3 attacking the bishop, and the bishop drops back to h5. And what might surprise you is in this position, white has a slight advantage. In this one, white is dominating. And I want you to take a little bit of time to try and find the best continuation for white. And we're gonna kind of walk through this together, but if you have ideas, feel free to kind of raise your hand or say something in the chat. Um, but I'm just gonna kind of point out some things I noticed. We wanna start with our forcing moves. So um, again, you can think about checks and captures, but mostly you wanna think about moves that limit your opponent's responses and that they are forced to respond to. So, for example, a very common type of idea could be something like bishop takes f7. This is a check, it's a capture. Uh, the only legal moves, there's only, I guess, four legal moves black would have in this position. They could take with the king, they could move the king out of the way to one of these two squares, or they could take with the bishop. You can spend some time looking at this one um, and seeing if it works. Um, and it, then we can identify, the, what I like to do first is identify all of our forcing moves. So that looks very forcing. What are the other forcing moves we have in this position besides bishop takes f7? If we have any, that could be the only one. Mm -hmm. There's a capture, which is knight takes e5. Yep, okay. Now, my hands are bold, but I doubt that. Wait, is, is there any bold? Mm. Mm. We'll see if you can tell me. So, yeah, knight takes e5 is a capture. I believe it's the only other really forcing move in this position. Um, but is it the Legal's mate? What do you think? I'll let you keep thinking about that. Um, username 0416, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, G4 is also a forcing move I did not consider. G4, we would attack the bishop and force it to retreat if they don't want to lose it or do something. This would be a big threat. So that's another good one to consider in the position. So what do you think? Yeah, so, okay, so you were totally correct, um, but let's actually break this down. So the idea is knight takes e5 looks like an insane move because it's like, wait a minute, we're one, we're just attacking a knight that's defended by a pawn, but then you look at it a little closer and you realize, wait a minute, okay, if they actually took the knight, then our queen takes their bishop. So, okay, we would just win a center pawn if they take back, and that's true if they take with the knight or with the pawn. We'll, we'll explore that a little more in depth in a moment. The bigger problem, it seems, is not only are we taking a pawn, but actually our knight is pinned. We're going to lose our queen. This is a pattern that's really famous called Legal's mate or Legal's trap, um, where we can play this. But even if you don't recognize the pattern, just thinking about these forcing moves that look very unnatural can help you find the truth of the position. If bishop takes queen, what is our forcing continuation? Mm -hmm. Bishop takes f7, uh, defended by the knight, it's a forcing move. Black only has one legal move, king to e7. And then knight to d5 checkmate. Yes, knight to d5, and we actually cover every single square that this king could go to. This is checkmate. Really, really beautiful queen sacrifice to get checkmate here. Um, there is one slight complication here. I want you to calculate here, knight takes e5, knight takes... Queen takes h5, and then knight takes c4. Wait, aren't we losing two pieces? We're losing our knight and our bishop, but black's only lost their bishop. What's wrong with this for black? So knight takes e5, knight takes... Queen takes h5, and then our knight, or their knight takes on c4. It seems like we've lost two pieces. 
but a few people in the chat are correct. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I apologize, but uh, the problem with this is we have another forcing move. It will be a little easier to see once I put it on the board. What is our forcing move to win back the material and maintain our advantage here? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Queen to b5, forking the king and the knight. And we're going to pick it back up. Whatever black plays, we can take the knight. And what happens in the end? Well, we won this center e5 pawn. We only won a pawn. It seems like that's a lot of work to get a pawn. But it is a center pawn. And uh, black is totally undeveloped. We have decent development. Our queen maybe is a little misplaced. But black doesn't have any good way to attack her. And we're up a pawn. Okay, so uh, first thing with forcing moves, they help us be efficient in our calculations. You don't have to spend as much time because you know what to look for. Second thing with forcing moves is they can help us look beyond what's a normal looking move, right? It is very unnatural to play a move that not only sacrifices our queen, but also just attacks something defended by a pawn with a piece. But this is the best move here. Uh, it's the only winning move. So. Being able to use forcing moves to our advantage to calculate and be creative is super, super helpful. The third thing I like about forcing moves is they can reveal truths about positions. So I want to, for this one, look at a game that I played. We're not going to go all the way through, but just the opening of it. Uh, so I was playing in a tournament here at the St. Louis Trust Club, and I had the white pieces. My opponent played c5, the Sicilian defense. I played pawn to c3, the Alapin variation of the c3 Sicilian looking to play pawn to d4. Knight to c6, pawn to d4, takes, takes. And I knew from my opening study that the only good move for my opponent in this position is to play pawn to d5. And the reason for that is they need to stop me from playing my own pawn to d5. My opponent did not. They played pawn to d6, which tells me, okay, I'm gonna play this move. And here I wasn't really sure what to do. Um, in the game, I decided I'm just going to develop with some tempo, get an attack on the knight. So I played knight to f3. And my opponent played the move bishop to g4. And I, something spelled a little fishy about this. I said, okay, you're putting a lot of pressure on me. If I just have to play like bishop e2 and unpin, that seems like I've missed something. It seems like I have an opportunity here. So in this position, see if you can take a second and look through some forcing moves and find the best continuation for white. This one is a little harder. And if you're having trouble, my advice is to, again, start with the forcing moves, right? What are our forcing moves in this position? Check. Okay. What else? Knight takes e5. Okay. Knight takes e5, just like last game. Uh, capture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and h3. h3 would be a forcing move, attacking the bishop. There's still at least one more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, queen to a4 check. And there might be more forcing moves, but those are the ones I was really considering in my game. Now, I actually very quickly eliminated h3. Um, I didn't like h3 because I, well, the problem is it's actually forcing my, it, they do have to move this bishop, but it's actually, I think they kind of want to, because if they take now, I can't take back with the queen. I'll lose it to the knight, which means I have to double my pawns. Not the end of the world, but maybe not like the most ideal thing either. There's some counterplay here, certainly. Maybe now I have this open file for my rook against their king, but um, I decided I didn't really wanna give them at least some advantage, potentially. So that left me looking at bishop b5 and queen a5, and I looked at these for a while. But there's a problem with both of these moves. What is wrong with, or wh why is bishop b5, it looks so good, this king is very trapped, um, it can't move at all, but how can black survive this? Mm 
Well, you don't want to move the knight to c6, because then I'm going to take it with my pawn. But, you're, but you can move the knight to d7, and you can also move the bishop to d7. So there's two pieces you can drop back, and maybe I have a slight advantage because I forced one of these pieces to retreat. I'm going to have a nice pin. That seems reasonable. Um, queen a5, probably slightly worse, because now after bishop d7, you've at least gained some initiative um, against my queen. So I was thinking, okay, the problem, these two forcing moves look so good and so natural, but the problem is you have a knight and a bishop to block this square. And then that's how I figured it out. That Looking at those forcing moves taught me very simply, if I can get rid of these two pieces, then I'm fine. Um, if I can get rid of these two pieces, I'm actually winning a queen, right? Check, and I, the queen has to block. And I have a way to get rid of them. If I take this knight with knight takes c5, I've gotten rid of one of them, and you have to do something. If you take back, I take your bishop, so I'm still winning there. Um, if you just move the bishop away, then I've won a knight, you know? So you have to take the queen. It's the only thing you can try. But I already know I can give this up because I can win a new one. Check. Queen blocks. Check. And in this position, I played another forcing move. Knight takes f7 check, forking the king and the rook. King takes bishop, and what's the best move for white here? Take the uh, rook. Take the rook is good. Better is taking the bishop, because this rook is trapped. Can't move either way. So we're going to get this no matter what black plays. But we don't want to let this bishop get away. So first we take the bishop, and now whatever move, I think in the game knight to f6 was played, now we can just take the rook. And I'm up nine points of material. I am ashamed to say I lost this game. But hopefully it has at least been instructive on using forcing moves. Um, okay, so our three reasons for forcing moves. One, efficiency. Two, creativity. Third, even if they don't work themselves, they can still teach you about the position and help you find a better move. Okay, with that under our belt, let's, excuse me, move along. Um, okay, so, and I'm actually going to go here. Okay, so I want to quickly talk about my process for how do you apply forcing moves in your games. I've just kind of put this nice little uh, Double rook checkmate in the background. Um, yeah, so uh, Andrew, quick side story. Um, <laughs> I lost because I, I had checkmate in one move and I touched the wrong rook. And so I touched move, I had to move it, and I just ended up losing a rook for free in the very end. And then I went on to lose a very close king and pawn endgame. Um, but, uh, okay, so forcing moves. And actually, maybe it will be a little helpful if we go back to that previous example one more time to kind of uh, let me help identify uh, my process. So I need to quickly jump down here. Okay. When used properly, forcing moves let us calculate efficiently, open us to thinking outside the box, and reveal these positional truths. But there is a problem with forcing moves. Before I get into the process of how we use them, I have to say this really big problem. The problem is, if we spend every turn looking at forcing moves, we will be playing a single game of chess for the rest of our lives. In the opening position, um, then the good news is in this position, there's actually not really any forcing moves because um, we can't get too close to our opponent or force anything. But you know, very quickly, you'll start to find that you know, forcing moves already in this position, we're making a threat. Maybe it's not the most serious threat because they can defend, but you know, forcing moves happen so often and in so many positions, it's really important to ask yourself, when do I actually need to stop and look for all the forcing moves? And when do I not have to do that? Uh, and I would say there's a few different kind of examples. In this game, when my opponent played pawn to d6, I knew from opening preparation that this was not a good move. I knew that they had to stop me from playing d5. So already in this position, well, in this case, I knew why they couldn't do that. 
But even if here I don't know why they can't do that, I should say that's an unusual move. If you are someone who plays chess games and don't like it when your opponent plays really weird openings, there's a good remedy, and it's to think there's a reason the moves they're playing are, is unusual. Like, there's a reason I don't see this move a lot, and it's probably because it's bad. Which means if you take a little bit of time and can try and reason out why it's bad, you might be able to find the right answer. In this case, I knew what the answer was, but it also happens to be our forcing move. Right? Pawn to d5 is forcing this knight to flee. It's taking space in the center. And in this position, the move knight to f3 isn't terrible, but it's not the best. Actually, the best move here is pawn to f4. Again, forcing this knight to move again, taking space in the center. Eventually, I am going to play knight f3, but I just I don't have this pawn behind it. I'm threatening to really just break through with pawn to e5. Um, and white's just kind of dominating. I think if you turn on the computer in this position, it's like plus two, plus three. Um, but even with missing this move, I still already know that there's something weird going on because my opponent is playing moves that I know aren't supposed to be good, and I have to find out why. So that has alerted what I call my tactical radar. This sense that, okay, this is the type of position I need to be looking for tactics. It's not the only thing. The other things in this particular position are uh, the presence of an exposed king. We, we noticed very quickly that bishop to b5 and queen to a4 both look like very strong moves. So noticing that there's a, a king that is exposed to be attacked. Um, in a previous lesson I did called Loose Pieces Drop Off, uh, you can find that lecture on YouTube. Uh, I also talked about anytime there are unprotected pieces. In this particular case, these aren't so much unprotected, but if I get rid of the knight, the bishop does become unprotected and this discovery works. So looking for little tactical patterns, um, like, like unprotected pieces or an exposed king, or um, even like pieces lined up, you know? So in this case, we have a pin. A pin is also a potential discovery. So looking for pieces that are lined up or batteries or uh, you know, back rank patterns, that's a very common one. If you see there's potentially a king that could be back ranked, that can lead to some really good tactical radar. So, and probably the best way to increase this for yourself is to work on puzzles. Um, you can do either short term puzzles or, or like kind of quick, try and solve them fast, like puzzle rush type stuff, or spending more time with puzzles. Both of them are going to give you a benefit. The benefit to those quicker puzzles is they're going to improve your pattern recognition. You've got to see what's going on on the board really quick. Longer puzzles are going to help you visualize what's going on better. You're going to spend more time analyzing all the different variations. Um, but all of that is to help you build what I call your tactical radar. So here's the process um, in very kind of a nutshell version that I use in my own games. First thing, I reach some position where my tactical radar is flickering. I'm like, okay, for some reason, either they've done some weird opening or I see there's an exposed king and some unprotected pieces, or maybe I have a battery that I can use, but I'm noticing there's something in the position that tells me I should slow down and look for some tactics. Second thing I wanna do is identify my candidate moves. What are all the forcing moves I have in this position? After that, I want to identify which of these is the most forcing look at all of my opponent's possible responses, and then I kind of want to calculate what is the easiest line to prove or refute. I either want to show definitively that whatever specific variation I'm looking at is going to uh, be advantageous for me or disadvantageous for me. Because if I can prove one or the other very quickly, I can just move on to the next move down the line. I either know, oh, this is what I want to do and play it, or this is not what I want to do, I got to move to the next one. Um, eventually, once you've evaluated all those options and you've repeated until you either find something that's really advantageous or not, you either just play it, or if you don't find one, you look at your non-forcing moves. You say, okay, maybe no forcing moves work in this position, and you can start looking at the natural but not forcing moves, developing, controlling the center, king safety, um, building uh, potential forks, or you know all the good stuff that we look at in our positional play. So let's go through this process. In this position, it is white to move. This is a complex idea. Uh, there's actually a few different ideas here. The first one, maybe not so much, but the second one is much more so. 
But I want you to take a little bit and using what we've looked at with forcing moves. Um, the downside with a puzzle is the puzzle just being a puzzle tells you the tactical radar is there, right? It tells you there is something to find in this position. But even if we don't know that, right, even if I'm just showing you this, there's some things you might start to notice uh, about potential tactical ideas. So even if you don't see the full solution, if anyone has reasons why their tactical radar might be flickering in this position, feel free to put them out there. Are you raising your hand? Mm -hmm. Another look are all lined up in that if you move the knight to d6, it comes with check. Okay, really good. I'm going to come back to you in a second, but I want to even stop you there because that's really helpful. One, you noticed uh, our rook and knight are lined up with black's rook, meaning we have discovery potential. Um, already, that's a good tactical vision. And then you notice, wait, one of our forcing moves is to call a check. We can call check, which means after they resolve this, um, our rook is going to be able to take their rook. Okay, so knight to g6, what are all of our opponent's possible moves? Mm -hmm. H takes g6 and king to g8. Yes, so, and that's it, right? They're in check by the knight. Um, they can either take it or move their king, and they only have one support to move it. Which of those do you think is the easiest to prove. Either you prove it works for you or it doesn't. Like, do which one of these do you think is easier to show whether it's going to give you an advantage or not? Mm -hmm. I believe it's the king g8 one. I, I agree, because? Rook takes f8 Yeah, so if we play knight g6, and they don't take it, this is checkmate. So already in your head, you can say, okay, I don't have to think about this line anymore. I've proven it doesn't work for black. Let's move on to the next one. What about H takes? Uh-huh. So after knight to g6, H takes g6, rook takes f8, and you're, you get a good exchange. Yeah, so we're going to be up in exchange. In this position, we're actually dead even on material. It's a little imbalanced. We have a rook and a pawn versus the bishop pair. Um, but we are going to give up a knight and get a rook. Good enough for me. I'm happy. But now, my tactical radar is still going off. We have an advantage, sure. But there's still something that seems a little fishy. This one is the harder one. But now, see if you can find how white can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, even though we're up a little material, we just want to prove this one way or another. So what are our forcing moves in this position? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two checks, both sacrifices, queen h6, rook h8. What other forcing moves do we have? Let's just identify as many as we can. There's probably not a lot more, but there are at least a few. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that rook takes d7 is a capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a capture. Um, I don't know that this one is as much a forcing move, because even though we're capturing, they don't have a way to recapture. So there's not something we're specifically forcing them to do. But it is still good to look at, right? This is maybe one of those examples where I would say, uh, a capture is not exactly a forcing move because it's not forcing our opponent to do any one thing. Um, but still a good potential move. But let's start with the forcing moves. Okay, between queen h6 and rook h8, which one do you think is the easiest one to prove? Again, either prove that it works or prove that it doesn't. Queen h6. Okay, so you think queen h6 is easy to prove? Yes. What do you think the line is? Or well, well. Uh, yeah, so the way, yeah, I'm trying to solve this is, what are all black's possible responses?
yeah, they're going to block a bunch, but uh, yes, precisely. So uh, actually, yeah, queen h6 is the easier one in this case. Um, rook to h8, some could argue is easier because there's just no solution, but, uh, but if you can already see, queen to h6 is the best move because black has two responses, take with the pawn or take with the king. Between those two, we narrowed it down and said taking with the king is easier to refute because if they take with the king, then actually simply playing rook to h8 will be checkmate. It's kind of a reverse back rank or like a sideways back rank um, because our pawn covers this square and our rook hits all three of these. So we can say, okay, queen h6, but what if they take with the pawn? Well, now we have the idea we saw earlier that you pointed out is we can take this but it's actually much better to wait because if this pawn is out of the way, then this is going to be a check, again, a forcing move. And black's pawn will be on h6. Our rook is still covering this rank. So this is just, the game is over. Queen to h6 takes, check, and black can delay the inevitable. They can throw a bunch of pieces in the way, but eventually this will be a check mate. And we found it, this kind of crazy queen h6 sacrifice move, because we were willing to say uh, either your tactical radar was alerted or because you knew it was a puzzle, you knew there was something here. But either way, we looked at some forcing moves. So um, looking at your forcing moves can help you really efficiently find the right solution to puzzles um, and in your games and can also show you, OK, I've looked at a bunch of options and none of these are working. Let's move on to the non-forcing candidate moves as well. Okay, um, let's take a look at this position here because I, I think it's very important to apply the idea of forcing moves both to your own moves and also to your opponents. So in this case, let's imagine that you've spent a lot of time because I don't have as much time left to help do this on your own. Um, let's imagine you're playing this in a game and you've spent enough time to rule out the obvious forcing moves. Let's say you say h6, Knight G or Knight F6 check, Bishop takes. You, you look at all these and you say they're no good. So now you have to find your own move, but you're also starting to realize that black has some forcing moves of their own. This move, Rook to A1 check, is a potential forcing move that you need to consider. Um, perhaps Knight takes F3, attacking your Rook is a move you need to consider. So see if you can identify the best sequence for your opponent. Let's say it was um, maybe Black's turn to move. What would they play here? And then how can we solve that for us? So yeah, Brennan, go ahead. Uh, knight takes pawn, either they give up the rook or check. Yes, so our forcing moves are really valuable because when we put, see these two moves together, knight takes f3, there we either save our rook or we save our king because this move not is actually a fork. It's forking the rook on g1. It's also forking the d2 square, which is where our king needs to escape. So let me just play some silly move. We have to now uh, save our king, something like king to b1, giving up our rook, because if we don't, this is checkmate. Okay, so that is the threat. How can we stop it? Can we stop it? Is king to b1 just on? King to b1 is playable. Or moving. The, the only reason king to b1 isn't like the best, it does stop rook to a1, and we don't have to worry about those checkmates, but they are going to pick up this pawn on f2 or sorry, on f3. So if we can avoid giving up the pawn, that's probably slightly better. Gary? Rook to f1. Which one? Or, do, or does it matter? G to f1. Okay, why? Um, mm -hmm. And first of all, that defends the pawn, which is exactly why I eliminated rook to... And then there's the knight after... Knight to e2, which is a fourth, and yeah. 
Okay, so yeah, I agree. Rook g3 defending the pawn is not so good. As you said, we found this forcing check. Um, it actually surprisingly does matter which of these two rooks you use. Um, it's, a, a again, maybe a little more advanced than, than the beginner breakdown is ready for, but actually rook d to f1 is a mistake, um, perhaps even a blunder, because still forcing moves are quite valuable. And actually the best move here for black is the same idea we looked at before. Knight takes f3. Forking our rook and our uh, escape square. The difference here is that when we take back, they pick up the rook like this. This does not work if we play rook from f2, uh, or sorry, rook from g to f1, because now, uh, well, now if you take, my, my king is still defending this rook, so this actually doesn't help you. And there's not really any, it doesn't matter if you switch the move order, like taking here doesn't really make a difference. Uh, all of my things are still defended. Um, okay, so that's basically all the time we have, but I want to thank you for coming. Hopefully this has been helpful in uh, learning about forcing moves and applying them to your games. Uh, and I hope to, I hope you stick around. Uh, actually, we have our Grandmaster's Choice class with Grandmaster Igor Novikov. So please stick around for that. It should be really exciting. But otherwise, uh, hope you take care and see you see later.